punk as a movement, for me, was very much a personal and artistic genre. Punk for me, unlike what most of the critics were describing it as at the time, was for me something very artistic. Now that is a personal and subjective view, but can be fully backed up by the fact that punk, in essence, was closer to the art to art making because it refused to be sold. Totally opposite to anything that had happened for a long, long time within the pop culture, which was, for all intents and purposes, best described as a shallow, innocuous, unimportant part of the culture. It was the lowest end. Punk raised the bar because it refused to be sold. Uh, that was so anti-commercial to most of the music industry that had got fat and greedy by the 70s. Um, they couldn't understand it because they didn't know, truthfully, how to exploit it. It was unexploitable. It was self-mutilating and destructive. And yet, at the same time, it registered a certain integrity in the hearts of a lot of young people who scream of blue murder by the time they reach puberty could be echoed in the loud, raucous, untrained, chaotic, cataclysmic revolt in the sound of it, of, of, of this music, and equally in the look of it. The look of the music and the sound of its fashion for the first time joined together to create an audio-visual spectacle that was very different from anything else that had preceded it before. And its roots lay in the possibility that every child that reached puberty had the possibility of joining it. It was very accessible. It didn't need any credentials. You didn't need to have to play very well. All you needed to have was an attitude that was anti-everything else. This aspect of the culture was so disorganized on one level and so appealing in that it didn't, um, it didn't bow down to anything in what you could describe as the corporate culture of the time. It made clear, for the first time, a new division between the corporate world, groups that were supposedly responsible and desiring success in the commercial sense, not wanting to appear to fail, but to succeed in a glorious fashion and sport all the accoutrements and lifestyle that would mean. Punk was exactly the opposite. So the industry and punk could never sit side by side. They could never sleep in the same bed. And eventually, eventually, in some respects, there were attempts, vain attempts, to co-opt this movement. And my personal position was to prevent as much as I humanly possibly could, the general co-option of such a movement. I was an artist, formerly, and with my art student friends, we created a kind of gang. We were a generation above the punk generation, 
And as a gang, we had certain cultural references that could be claimed to be political. And we simply wanted to create an environment that you could truthfully run wild in. We felt pop culture had little integrity by that time. And if we were to do anything with it, maybe the best thing to do would be to destroy it. So ultimately, born out of this at first very um, haphazard, organic process of standing in my store on the King's Road, auditioning possibly for a group that had nothing better to do, a group of young individuals who were all, in some respects, dysfunctional elements of the society with little prospects or any sense of career. They were perfect to adapt, adopt, and to configure into this idea of a group that would go out and set itself up as assassins, as young assassins, young sexy assassins of the culture. Voila, that's why they were named by me the Sex Pistols. Much followed after it. It was a, as if you, you lit one little match and the entire generation was sp just sprung into action like a forest fire. Because of its, uh, because it, it, it somehow fed into this desire to experiment with your sexuality, feel incredibly free in that respect and liberating, and demonstrate all your sexual powers and your, your, your actual ability to test your own immortality. When you're very, very young, you believe you're immortal. You believe you can do everything. You're completely invulnerable. To test that, to test the goalposts, how far can you go? Punk offered that opportunity. It also offered the, 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 the immediate uh, feeling that it was a very much a do-it-yourself culture, a culture that you could um, that you could simply uh, belong to by just stealing a guitar, any guitar from a department store, uh, stealing safety pins from your mother's bathroom closet, grabbing a bin liner from the garbage of the kitchen, and you were ready to rock. I think after a few years, because it was an extremely short moment from 1976 to 1978, um, it was like a rocket that went up so fast, it just caught the entire generation's imagination to get rid of what appeared to be a culture that was moribund, a culture of the 60s, a culture that seemed so inaccessible to this new generation that they didn't feel they could ever belong to it. They would always feel like they were playing, as we say in English, second fiddle to their brother's music, their older brother's music and culture. And remember, the 1970s was a very bleak period particularly in the UK. The government had to go to the IMF to borrow money. The country was on the verge of bankruptcy and all its old infrastructure, based and rooted in Victorian times from the Industrial Revolution, was falling apart because this culture of what we could best describe today as the culture of necessity, in other words, a culture that you grew up with in the 1950s as a culture in which you only consumed what you needed to in order to survive, had been completely, irrevocably replaced by this culture that had swept in to England from the United States, a culture that had within it rock and roll, a culture that's best described as a culture of desires, where you consumed everything you didn't need in order to survive. These two cultures were polar opposites and there was no way they could sit comfortably anymore 
side by side, and one had to give way to the other. The culture of desires just pushed the culture of necessity out of the window, and England's old industrial infrastructure was falling apart, leaving a lot, a lot of people unemployed, very little understanding within the educational system as to how this new generation could pursue a career. The old guard seemed to me become meaningless, and the country seemed to be based from a political standpoint on a culture of deception. We had become a nation of liars. We were brought up just preaching and talking about a country that supposedly was great, but it didn't belong to you anymore. Nothing. This map of the world, all coloured pink as you entered school, and a teacher saying, you own all of this, from Canada to Australia, from India to the South American islands and the Caribbean, Africa, everywhere was yours, everywhere coloured pink. Well, by the time you left school, you realised none of it was yours at all. It had all become independent. Wars and wars and wars had continued after the post-war of independence. Everybody was being liberated, and the only people that weren't liberated were this new generation, who now demanded to be liberated too from this ugly, deceptive, nasty, class-ridden, old-fashioned, horrible, moribund culture that was the United Kingdom. Punk was a fantastic way of making a declaration of intent, of a manifesto that enabled, empowered you to express yourself where others within the established uh, culture were not going to allow you to go. So it was a club you could join and be clear when you did in the coda of what you wore and how you acted that was going to be the absolute antithesis of everything else that was out there on the street. You stood out in the crowd with your black bin liner, your, 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 your um, studded uh, collar, your bondage trousers, the, the whole act of being all tied up with nowhere to go. You were a symbol, a, 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 a screaming beacon of light that unquestionably anybody foreign and those that were local would immediately recognize as something that felt that deeply uncomfortable and scary for them. So once that culture had manifested itself within two years, it was like, well, now you've destroyed the actual basis of what we believe the culture is that we own, this popular culture, music, fashion, cinema, and so on. What are you going to replace it with? You know, it's like after the Holocaust, the reconstruction of the debris. What are you going to construct out of all of this? At which point, it was really difficult to answer in 1979. Sid Vicious, someone I was managing, had died. His girlfriend, who he had inadvertently been accused of murdering. Uh, the industry was now clawing back certain control that they had lost two years previously. And with the dawn of the 80s, there was a sense that the next generation didn't want to dress down, didn't want to have this existential look, didn't want to debate the politics of boredom, didn't want to care about answering why is boredom political, didn't want to note any of the feelings that punk had except one, which was, we're going to reclaim the culture for ourselves. We're going to pick and mix from it what we like. Just like going into a supermarket, we'll play these chords, we'll take this sound, we'll do this, we'll do that. We'll reassemble, we'll 
we will reconstruct ourselves. And that air of independence was very strong in the pop culture. And I think punk allowed uh, a kind of foundation for those who wanted to reconstruct something could now do. At the same time, what punk had done was create this new identity between fashion and music. And the 80s could take that on board. The look was as important as the music and still remains so in the 80s. So what was of the late 70s was still being thrown around the 80s, but it was all about getting dressed up not getting dressed down in the same place. There was no need to feel nihilistic in a, way, in a sense. And something strange happened at the dawn of the 80s, what no one was thinking about in the 70s, and that was technology had arrived to provide you with a very different form of, of products that allowed you that could allow you, very different sort of products that could allow you to um, make music yourself with relative ease in the confines of your basement, of your own suburban dwelling at your mum's. The dual cassette player had been invented which provided you with the ability to tape off the radio and tape songs and give them to friends. The blank cassette now, the dual cassette player, had begun what we have today on the internet with all the downloading, had begun right here at the dawn of the 80s. It had happened back in the 50s with an old-fashioned tape recorder, but here it was easier. You could carry it around, you could put it on your shoulder. It even became part of the uniform and the way you looked in the, in, the, uh, in the 80s. And this would be spinning off, particularly with the Afro-American sound <coughs> that became labeled later as hip hop. So that technology, the technology of um, being able to sample music, um, uh, machines that could that, that could sample music and could basically allow you to play with that music on top of other music. This sort of, if you like, post-war cut-up technique, which may have been devised in literature by the likes of William Burroughs, was now being sped into the pop culture with the machinery to do it. So everybody could cut and paste. Punk had already demystified the process that anybody could make a pop and rock and roll record. Now anybody could, but they could do it by grabbing other people's music wholesale. Instead of the Sex Pistols stealing uh, the chord sequence from Dancing Queen by ABBA and turning it into Pretty Vacant, now you could just literally take ABBA and boof, stick it together with Elvis Presley or whoever else you wanted to. You could make music out of other people's music and proudly present it as such, particularly within the confines of the dance club. The dance club, this underground uh, uh, disco in the basement cellars all around London and everywhere else in Europe was now profiting by this desire on behalf of the new generation to be DJs rather than necessarily be in bands, to not have to play guitars, didn't have the patience, didn't have the time, didn't really care, and it didn't feel it was in style. No, they needed a, just a keyboard to sample music, make a sound with it, program a beat, Maybe spin a record or two and grab the beats directly off the vinyl from an old James Brown or any other record. All of these things were breaking open and they all served the purpose of making the center of the creative pop culture the dance club. And out of it would spawn a whole new generation 
who in some respects didn't mind the anonymity and facelessness of the DJ. After all, he, what, a DJ isn't someone that jumps in front of the record decks and spawns a kind of style. It didn't seem important. The audience were more important. That was again another ramification of the punk movement where the audience became as important as the star. This was already an exchange in the dance clubs, but naturally there was a desire when you go to dance clubs, just the idea of it, you wanted to dress up. Cocktails, uh, all kinds of strange drug-infused drinks suddenly came on the market, all these strange boosting drinks, another kind of chemical part of the technology that was dawning in the 80s was now, how do we get a new drink for this new generation? All of this was going on in the club scene and the drugs were changing accordingly. And with it, it spawned a, a kind of dressing up, uh, willingness to, 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 to really, um, uh, look like you were out for a purely hedonistic good time. It, it was um, in part a lot more selfish perhaps than the 70s in that regard. It was very individualistic um, and uh, uh, the icons were movies that we were beginning to come out at that time, like Desperately Seeking Susan. Um, there were a number of, of things that were happening in America with the era of John Hughes, the director, and films like Pretty in Pink. Um, there was this desire for young people to look old again. When you were a punk, it, you were ageless, it was timeless, it didn't even have a, you, you couldn't quantify this was a teenager and this was a 25 year old. Suddenly people wanted to feel important in their age. They suddenly wanted to kind of grow up very quickly. They, 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 they loved this idea of taking makeup to the extreme in that way. Suddenly hairstyles were not about shearing your hair off and having little spiky haircuts, but lots of curls tremendous femininity, but being tough, um, being able to wear um, and mix and match clothes. The crossing of genders, which happened in punk, was now being redeveloped too. You know, you, you, you could, instead of wearing all black, you might wear a shimmering uh, nylon sort of petticoat with huge biker boots, with big black me cold makeup, with a lot of glitter on your cheeks, with your hair even permed up. There was a desire to experiment and do all of that because it went hand in hand with the sound inside these dance clubs.